Okay, so in this uh, very last lecture, I'm going to describe a rather recent work with uh, Wang Ching Lu and Ahmed Zariani, where we developed the first steps of a pluripotential approach uh, for the Calarici flow. And uh, let me start by giving the geometric motivation as always. So as I explained in the previous lecture, uh, one would like, one, one needs uh, to consider degenerate complex motion pair flows. So the underlying variety V is mildly singular. Let's say it has log terminal singularity. So, and uh, one can still make sense of the Kalarici flow and uh, describe it equivalently in terms of scalar parabolic uh, complex motion pair equations. But then the, the equation, the correct equation become degenerate in various ways. So it takes the following form. So the Mont-Jean-Pair of phi t, this uh, family of uh, potentials, uh, should be equal to e to the time derivative of phi t plus some function in time, space, n of phi t, if we consider the normalized version of the clarity flow, times uh, something which is a measure where you replace the volume form by a volume form with density, which I denote by G. So here I'm working on a smooth desingularization X of V. I denote by pi the desingularization map. Therefore, the corresponding omega T's are no longer Keller. They are the pullback of Keller forms on V. So they are merely big and semi-positive. And uh, we have a fixed uniform in time lower bound, uh, which is given by uh, this uh, notation, which I denote by theta. And uh, the smooth analysis will take place on the ample locus of this fixed lower bound theta. So this is a fixed Zariski open set. Uh, the function f is smooth uh, in each variable. And it is uh, essentially increasing in the last variable. So quasi increasing means here that the derivative of f with respect to the third variable is, uh, if not positive, at least bounded below uniformly by a fixed negative constant. And you should keep in mind that the main geometric application will be where the dependence in phi is actually linear in phi. This is, uh, for instance, for the Kelerichi flow where you have this lambda phi term, okay? And in that geometric application, the derivative of f with respect to the last variable is simply lambda, okay, or minus lambda. And g, which is perhaps the most important piece of the story here, is this density that we obtain when we resolve the uh, adapted volume form on the, on the singular v, and it will have both poles and zeros, and uh, depending on the nature of the singularities that we are considering. So only zeros if we consider canonical singularities and poles as well as zeros if we consider log terminal singularities. But in any case, as I explained last Thursday, uh, what is, remains important is that this exponent p is strictly bigger than one. And this property was the analytic characterization of the fact that we are considering log terminal singularities. Okay, so the point of view that we have developed with uh, Chin and Ahmed is that we would like to consider this parabolic equation as a second order PDE on the two n plus one dimensional manifold xt, which is the time interval zero t times the complex manifold x. So we would like to interpret the left-hand side in the sense of pre-potential theory. Namely, I will assume that uh, phi, I will, I, will, I will think of phi as a family of bonded omega t parasomic functions. And therefore, I can make sense of omega, the mojampere of phi t to the n in the sense of Bedford theory. 
that I described in lecture three. And then I will add this uh, time uh, component and interpret mon um, jumper of phi t wedge dt as a well-defined positive radon measure on this 2n plus 1 dimensional manifold xt. OK. And then in that context, I can expect, as I already explained to you, good convergence results. So if uh, we will proceed by approximation, or will we need to approximate our objects. So if I have uh, either decreasing or increasing approximants, then the mont uh, the corresponding mont pair operator, or the left-hand side, if you like, will, do, will converge. Similarly, if I have uniform convergence of approximant, I will have convergence. If I have this energy uh, convergence, so this was the strong topology uh, from lecture uh, five, I guess, when I developed the, the topology on the class E1, then again, I will have continuity of the corresponding motion pair, parabolic motion pair guy. But let me stress and Re recall that these operators are not fully continuous, especially they are not continuous for the L1 topology. Okay, so this is a, a warning. What about the right hand side? So, here is the point of view that we would like to consider in order to have a well defined right hand side. So, we are going to uh, adopt a lobaic point of view, if you like. I will we will try and make sure that the dependence in time is locally uniformly Lipschitz, at least away from time zero. And that way, the time derivative of phi will be well-defined almost everywhere, both in space and in time. So I can make sense of e to the dt phi. Then uh, let me stress that at time zero, I cannot expect to have Lipschitz control up to time zero, because if that would be the case, then it would imply in particular that phi zero should be continuous and actually even a bit more than that. And this, as you have realized in previous lecture, uh, it is important that one can start the flow from a rather rough initial data. So I don't want to have a, to, to constraint imposed a priori on the initial data phi zero. So once again, in order to make sense to, the, to, to have this right-hand side uh, well-defined, uh, if dt phi is well-defined almost everywhere, that suffices to define this right-hand side in, in the sense of uh, Lebesgue, Mr. Ritze, and I don't ask for such a control up to time zero, such a Lipschitz control up to time zero. So let me make the following definition. A parabolic potential phi will be a family, a time-dependent family of omega t parasonic function, which is locally uniformly Lipschitz in time away from uh, the initial time zero. So that will be my main uh, category object, of object. But unfortunately, it does not suffice to develop the theory. So here is a very important uh, property that we are going to try and impose. Namely, we want that the dependence in T is not only locally Lipschitz, but also locally uniformly semi-concave in time. And the reason for that is that when, when we are going to approximate our object, we would like to pass to the limit in the time derivative. And if you only have a weak convergence, then there is no way or no reason why the time derivative of the approximant should converge towards the time derivative of the limit. On the other hand, if you have such a strong information of a semi-concavity, then it is known that uh, you have convergence of the time derivative. So this is what we are going to try and get in order to be able to pass to the limit in the equation. OK, so here is the, the statement I would like to try and explain a bit uh, in this last lecture. I start from an initial data, which is a bounded 
the omega zero proxemic function. So this is the Cauchy initial data. And I assume that F, I don't need to assume it is smooth, continuous uh, suffices by far in, in the three variable, but I will need a bit more in each variable. So here are the precise assumption. So I assume like I explained, uh, which corresponds to geometric application that it is almost increasing in the last variable. And I also assume it is almost uh, semi-convex, locally uniformly semi-convex in the first, sorry, in the first and in the third variable. This is not it. I also assume that the density is in LP. This you are getting used to it, but I need, and this is actually uh, necessary to assume that the set where G is vanishing has zero level measure. Uh, from a geometric perspective, it's not uh, a big problem because uh, in geometric application, G will be uh, positive on uh, the ample locus, which is, uh, so might, the only place where it might not be positive is a closed analytic subset for geometric application. Then the conclusion is that there exists a unique parabolic potential phi which has the following property. So first, it is locally uniformly bounded in both space and time variable. So here, the uh, locally term, uh, the, the fact that it is only locally uniformly bounded means that it may blow up as you approach the final time t, okay? But that's not the main issue for our purpose right here. So you can think if you prefer uh, intuitively that it is essentially uniformly bound. Second uh, piece of information is that phi is locally uniformly semi-concave in time. And here, and I, let me stress it, uh, you do not you do not expect this to hold as t goes to zero. So the, the constant of semi-concavity blows up at times uh, goes to zero. And uh, finally, you, this phi is uh, a solution of the equation. So you see that the left-hand side is well-defined in the bedford taylor sense because phi is locally uniformly bonded. Uh, and, and omega t prosomnic. And the right hand side is well defined because dt phi is well defined almost everywhere. So the left hand side, which is a Bedford Taylor type measure, coincides with the right hand side, which is well defined in the Lebesgue sense almost everywhere. Okay. And finally, uh, you need to impose a Cauchy information. And the information is that phi t converges towards this initial datum phi zero in the L1 topologies. And let me stress immediately, and I will go back to that in the next slides, that actually uh, the convergence at time zero is much better than simply in L1, as you will see uh, soon. Uh, for instance, if phi zero uh, would, would be continuous, then the convergence at time zero would be uniform. So it's a rather strong uh, convergence at time zero. Okay, so that's uh, the main result. And you see that with rather, rather poor regularity assumption, we get a unique solution in the pluripotential sense of uh, of the, the corresponding complex Mojang pair flows. So let me try and explain a bit this uh, with more details. And before that, let me compare two uh, previous uh, works in a similar direction. So first there was work by Song and Tian, where they develop a theory of weak energy flow in this geometric context of mildly singular projective varieties. But uh, the theory is a bit unsatisfactory for uh, various aspects. It relies on the projective, uh, it uses the projective assumption on one hand, 
it requires rather stronger variety in the, on the regular part of the variety. And therefore, it is not very flexible uh, for many purposes, both from the existence and from the uniqueness point of view. As I already said, this paper was published in 2017, but actually the preprint version goes back to 2009. So since then, several other approaches have been developed. With ECU and Zeriai, we have developed a viscosity approach to this uh, problem. And uh, the good point is that it applies to the color setting. It applies to uh, canonical singularities, uh, uh, so to interesting geometric uh, contexts, but uh, it requires, uh, it has two drawbacks. First, by the very, uh, if you like, definition or very nature of the method, it requires the data to be continuous, which they are not always. For instance, you see the initial data phi zero. Uh, it's very important that it should be allowed to be only bonded rather than continuous and even less regular than that. And the second drawback is that we cannot deal with log terminal singularities with this viscosity approach. Uh, so uh, another point that uh, I mentioned in the previous lecture is that regarding the smoothing properties, one can start actually from a, an initial data, which is even less than bounded, but this is not my point in this last lecture. So this is something that is uh, well understood as I already mentioned. Uh, okay, so now I would like to focus on this more, uh, which we consider to be much more efficient per potential approach. Uh, okay, so what's the strategy? Well, one possible strategy is not the only one, and by the end of the lecture, I will perhaps explain a slightly different one, is to proceed by approximation. So omega t is not exactly Keller. It is smooth, semi-positive and being, let's add some small piece of positivity. This is the omega tj. F is continuous. So let's approximate F uniformly by Fj, which is uh, smooth. G is has poles and uh, zeros. Let's approximate G in LP sense by smooth and positive densities Gj. Then you have approximating flows. So what we are going to prove is a certain number of approximates in order to be able to pass to the limit. And as I already stressed, the summing concavity property is then crucial in order to pass to the limit. I will come back to that a bit later. And uh, we will need a parabolic version of the maximum principle that is more efficient than the maximum principle that I have presented in the in the previous lecture, in order to get uniqueness and, uh, and efficient tools. Okay, so that's the plan. And uh, in the local setting, we have developed an alternative uh, approach. And this has been pushed one step further by uh, my PhD student, uh, Chuan, who is uh, online. And I will mention this by the end of the lecture. Okay. Uh, so for a, a little while, let me assume that I'm considering these approximating flows, but I will get rid of this, the, the upper script J, okay? So the flows will be smooth, but I will try to produce very uniform approximates. So here, as I said, there are essentially three uniform estimates to, to be uh, established. Here is the first one or at least the way it looks like. So we fix a finite capital time. These, uh, these approximating uh, Keller forms, they lie strictly in between a small uh, big and uh, fixed big and semi-positive and big form theta one and a fixed uh, Keller form theta plus. Then I have explained in lecture three and four that in that context, we know how to find a unique normalized function rho plus, which is theta plus uh, parasomonic bonded 
and which solves the, the Monchampar equation theta plus plus DDC of rho plus to the n equals e to the C plus GDV, where C plus is a normalizing constant. And one can do the same with theta minus, rho minus, and then normalizing constant C minus. And the normalizing constant are simply uh, imposing the equality of masses uh, on both the, the left and the right hand side. Okay, so I use the elliptic theory in order to, to, to get in the fact that there, I already know the existence of such solution rho plus and rho minus. Then the proposition is like this. If I consider the function u plus, which is of t and x, which is rho plus of x plus c t plus one, then you see it's a dependence in t and x, which is very special. It is actually somehow separated. You have a function in x and then a piece of function in t, affine in t. Then the claim is that u plus is a super solution to the Mongean pair flow with the initial data phi zero. And uh, similarly, u minus is a sub solution to the corresponding Mongean pair flow. So I'm not going to explain that, but uh, as a consequence, the proof is rather simple. And as a consequence, you get the first a priori estimate namely that the solution phi t lies in between u plus and u minus, but because we know by the elliptic theory that rho plus and rho minus are uniformly bounded, then we get uniform bounds from above and from below for the solution phi t. Okay, so to summarize, uh, the first uniform apparatus estimate is a relatively simple consequence of the elliptic theory uh, which is the extension of uh, Yao's uh, result. Okay, the Lipschitz, uh, so here the dependence on the constant, but let me skip that for, for right now. The Lipschitz control is a bit more involved. It's not that difficult, but it's a bit more technical. So here it goes. It says that there are some uniform, there is a uniform constant C, so that the following holds. So, dt phi blows up from above at most like one over t and almost does not blow up uh, from below. And again, I'm not going to prove that one. I'm going to prove the next one. It's not very difficult, but it's a bit technical. So it's not so, so perhaps so easy to get uh, within a few minutes here, but um, by comparison to the previous one, uh, the previous constant in the C0 uh, context were only depending on the soup and the inf norm of f. Here, the dependence goes one step further, asking for control on the first derivative of f, both with respect to time and with respect to the sub variable. So let me be a bit more precise. Uh, Oh yeah, before going on, let me observe uh, here that this lower bound is actually uh, rather nice. In particular, you see by integrating the lower bound that phi t is greater or equal than phi zero modulo a narrow term, which is almost Lipschitz in time. And what this says, or at least one particular information that you get out of that, is that phi t stays essentially above phi zero. And therefore, if we know, and we will know uh, for some weak reason that phi t converges in L1 to phi zero, then I have recalled, so when was that? I think uh, one week ago in lecture uh, five, that if a sequence of parasomic function converges in L1, then the limb soup of the limit of, of the sequence is always less or equal than the limiting parasomic function. And here you have the reverse information. And this tells you a lot. So if phi t 
is essentially above phi zero, then as soon as you have L1 convergence, then actually you have a rather strong convergence. So I'm not going to say more about this, but you should keep this in mind that uh, this, this bound from below is very efficient in order to get stronger conversions, say, at zero. Okay? So let me now uh, go to the third estimate and try and explain the proof of it. And here it is. So under the same assumption, I need one extra piece of information, which is a control from above on the second time derivative of omega t. Then we have the following uh, information. Phi t, that was one of our goal, is uh, uniformly, it, it locally uniformly semi-concave in time. And here is a, is a precise statement, namely, the second time derivative of phi t is almost negative. And if you, if you stay a bit away from time zero, then you see that by subtracting a fixed constant, it will be negative, okay? This is what it means to be semi-concave. It is uniform in x, but the constant do blow up as t approaches zero, okay? And the dependence on the constant uh, is the same as previously, but then for this last estimate, you also need to control the second derivative of f both in time, so with respect to twice time, and then with respect to time and the third variable. Okay, so I would like to give you a hint of the proof, a sketch of the proof of this estimate, which I consider to be one of the most important in the paper. And uh, let me actually uh, do that in a just slightly simplifying uh, setting. I will actually kill the function f it's not, it's not the, 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 the main difficulty here. So let me assume capital F is zero. And rather than considering uh, an arbitrary smooth pass of scalar form omega t, let me consider this affine pass, which is the one that we have already encountered when considering the Ricci flow. Okay? So this is precisely the one that we, we get when considering the, the scalar Ricci flow equation. Then uh, I'm going to prove an actually better estimate. And for that, I'm going to consider h of t and x, which is t times the second derivative of phi with respect to time. And my plan is to show that h is bounded from above by n, which is the complex dimension. In other words, uh, rather than proving that phi double dot t is less than c divided by t, square, I will get that it is bounded from above by n divided by t. So it's a better uh, upper bound on the second time derivative. Okay? So this is the goal. And I will spend the next two slides improving this uh, bound from above on the second time derivative of phi. Okay. So the heart of the matter is to establish the following claim. I consider ST, which is the evolving Keller form, and uh, the Laplacian of ST is uh, by definition this quantity. And then I want to prove that the heat operator d by dt minus the Laplacian of ST applied to this function h is bounded from above by this specific uh, expression phi t double dot minus t phi t double dot square divided by f. So this is my claim and I'm going to prove it on the next slide but let me let me use it right away let me accept it for a little while and use it to derive the conclusion. So if we know that then we can analyze the maximum of the function h. Let's pick t0, x0, which is a point, a point at which h is, uh, reaches its maximum. So we have an alternative. Either, either t0 is 0, then, well, h at this point is 0. So h at any point is less than 0. 
and we are even we have an even better upper bound than what we wanted. What it says is that phi t double dot is non non positive, is negative. Okay. So what I'm claiming is that perhaps this is too good to be true, but at least this h will be less or equal than n. So if t zero is zero, then we are good. What happens if t zero is positive? Well, then the heat operator at the maximal point at t zero x zero is positive. <coughs> Therefore, with the claim, what we do get is that phi t double dot minus n uh, t phi t double dot squared divided by n is positive. I multiply by t zero, and what I do get by this claim is that uh, t zero phi t double dot t at t zero is less or equal than n, and therefore h is less or equal than n. Okay. So either it's at time zero, then we are very good, or it's at time at a positive time, and then we are still good enough to, to say that H is less or equal than that. Okay, so that's the, the, the way we use the claim. And let's now prove the claim. So I want to prove that D by DT minus Laplacian ST of H is less than this quantity, where I recall here because I have changed slides. Uh, ST is the evolving Keller form. H is T times phi T double dot. And uh, let me recall you also the uh, complex Mongean pair flow equation, which is ST to the N equals E to the DT phi GDV. Or written differently, phi T dot is log of the ratio of STN divided by GD. Okay. So I want what? I want to uh, take time derivative of T phi T double dot. So I will differentiate the flow equation. If I differentiate the flow equation, then you see that the only on the left hand side, I have phi t double dot. On the right hand side, I'm differentiating essentially log of st to the n because g dv does not depend on time. Okay. So what I do get is n times st dot times st n minus one divided by st to the n. But st has this simple dependence in time. st dot is simply chi plus i dd bar phi t dot. Now I need to differentiate once more. So what I do get when I differentiate a third time phi t with respect to time, well, either I differentiate the piece chi plus i dd bar phi t dot. Then what I get is the Laplacian of phi t double dot with respect to st. Or I differentiate the denominator. Then I get this middle term minus n square times the square of what I have. And eventually, I need to differentiate st to the n minus 1. And then what I do get is n n minus 1, chi plus i d d bar phi t dot square, where st to the n minus 2 divided by st to the n. OK? So it's not very, uh, it's not extremely pleasant, but it's not very difficult either. So now I'm making the important observation that I can compare part of the middle term and part of the last term. So I'm claiming that the middle term, if I, if I get rid of n square and n, n minus one, I'm claiming that there is an inequality in between the middle term and the last term. And I write n square, which is n, n minus one plus n in order to use this inequality, which is the following. For any form eta, which is 
be careful, I want to apply this with eta, which is chi plus idd bar of it dot. So eta has no sign, but nevertheless, eta square omega to the n minus two divided by omega to the n, I claim this is less or equal than the square of eta omega n minus one divided by omega to the n. And once again, I apply this with eta being chi plus idd bar phi t dot, and I do get the inequality uh, just above. Okay, let me go on with this. I observe now that what is the term that I'm taking the square of chi plus idd bar phi t dot wedge st n minus one divided by st to the n is exactly phi t the double dot divided by n, as you can see from uh, the one previous computation. So therefore, I obtain that the third time derivative of phi t is less or equal than the Laplacian of phi t double dot minus phi t double dot square divided by n. And when I now consider the full heat operator, what I do get is that applied to h, it is exactly phi t double dot plus t phi t triple dot. This is when I just look at the time derivative, so dh by dt, and then minus t times the Laplacian of phi t double dot because h is t phi t double dot. And with the previous inequality, when I plug in in there the previous inequality, you see that phi t, so t phi t triple dot is less than t the Laplacian minus t phi t double dot square divided by n. So I end up with this inequality. And this is exactly the statement of the plane. So what's the general proof of the semi-concavity inequality? Well, it's exactly the same scheme, but now you need to take into account all the terms that come from the f function and also all the uh, re remaining terms coming from differentiating an arbitrary or general Keller pass of forms omega t rather than this affine pass. So that I get the, the main idea and the main inequalities are already present in this very simplified uh, setting. Okay. So uh, I have uh, saved uh, your brain and energy uh, so far from uh, differentiating the complex Mojampa equations. And I guess this was probably a lack in the previous lectures. So at least you have seen uh, how we can play around with differentiating uh, complex Mojampa flows. So let me go on. Once we have established these uh, three uh, pure estimates, what do we do? Well, as I said, we proceed by approximation. And uh, along the approximation process, we have established the following in three inequalities. So phi j, the approximants remain uniformly bounded. The time derivative of phi j remains uh, uniformly bounded away from zero. And the time, the second time derivative remains uniformly bounded from above away from zero. We can therefore use a property that uh, we have encountered uh, quite a few times, namely uniformly bounded omega t parasonic functions evolve in a L1 compact subset of functions. So we can extract, as j goes to plus infinity, we can extract converging subsequence. Relabeling, if necessary, we get phi j converges to some phi in L1. And moreover, and this I have not had the time to explain that, because the Mont-Jean-Pair of the phi j are equal to something which is essentially uniformly under control independently of j with LP density, we get actually a stability property. And this stability property tells us that actually phi j 
uniformly converge towards phi in that particular setting. And because of that, we, has, we have convergence of the Mongean pair operator. So Mongean pair of phi j converges towards Mongean pair of phi. And on the other hand, the right-hand side of the equation do also converge because of the semi-concavity. So what I'm saying here is that dt phi j converges almost everywhere to dt phi because the phi j are essentially uh, concave, if you like. Okay, this uh, semi-concavity helps us in uh, passing to the limit. So at the end of the day, we get a solution to the equation. And moreover, with the strong kind of information or piece of information I've uh, emphasized earlier, we will also have a good control at time zero. So we also have convergence to phi zero at time zero. So this is the way we uh, construct one solution. But of course, uh, if there are too many, then the theory is probably not that good. So let me say a few words about the uniqueness. The uniqueness relies on the, so on the following parabolic comparison principle, uh, which can be stated like this. Assume that you have two uh, families of parabolic potentials, which are bounded. Assume that phi is a sub-solution to the parabolic problem, while uh, psi is a super-solution to the parabolic equation. And let me assume also that uh, psi is locally uniformly semi-concave in time. Okay, so this property that we have established for the at least one solution of the problem. Then the conclusion is that if at time zero you have the appropriate inequality, the sub-solution is less than the super solution, then this property will uh, hold forever. So in particular, if you have two solutions, phi and psi of the equations, of, of the parabolic equation, which do match at time zero, and if they are locally uniformly semi-concave in time, then they should be the same forever. So there is uniqueness of the solution. Okay. Uh, I have to say, I cannot convey an idea of the proof of this uh, in even uh, several minutes. The proof is rather intricate because by comparison to what I explained in the previous lecture, where I was dealing with very smooth uh, equations, here due to the lack of regularity, the proof is actually quite long. Uh, in the paper, it uh, occupies uh, 10 pages. And um, it relies heavily on two tools. The first is a corresponding comparison principle with low regularity in the elliptic setting. And the second is a certain stability estimate that I did not have time to, to explain earlier, but that we are using at uh, several places in, in the paper. Okay, so let me accept that. You have at least an idea from previous lecture of why such a result should hold in when everybody is smooth. And, and the proof was rather simple. And here, uh, I'm sorry about that, but uh, it requires quite a lot of work. Okay, let me now uh, explain how to apply such tools uh, say in a case that I haven't been dealing with uh, so much so far, which is the case of Calabria variety. So let's say that a Q Calabria variety is a Keller variety with mild singularities. So in particular, the canonical Langmann rule is well defined. So the precise definition is that it should be a Gorenstein space of finite index with trivial first chunk class and low terminal singularities. Then uh, for such a variety, let's look at the evolution of the Keller shift flow. So we fix omega zero okay, uh, Keller form. Well, it's rather a Keller form here.
and phi zero a bounded omega zero plus omega function, then the Keller chi flow dst by dt equals minus ratio of st exists for all time and continuously deforms this initial positive closed current as zero towards the unique singular Kalanchian current cohomologous to omega zero. This current uh, was constructed in lecture, uh, lecture what? Lecture seven, I guess, as a consequence of the resolution of complex, degenerate complex Morgan pair equations in that context. Okay? So using the estimates from lecture four uh, and applying them to uh, the singular Calabi conjecture. Okay, so this is the uh, analogous result as the one from Sao from 1985, which I mentioned in previous lecture, where the convergence was smooth and the Keller shift flow would deform any Keller initial Keller metric, any initial Keller form to the unique Keller Ricci flat uh, metric homologous to the initial data. Okay? So let me explain uh, roughly or briefly the proof of this. Uh, yeah, and let me also mention that uh, with viscosity tools, uh, this, the same result was obtained with ACDU and Zariai uh, when the underlying variety has only canonical singularities. Okay, so the proof goes by translating this problem into a problem of uh, complex water flow. So here is the flow. So it takes a rather simple form. In particular, you see that omega does not move with time. So it's a fixed, it's the pullback of a Keller form. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking at a desingularization pi of, the, of uh, V. And I pull back the initial data, omega zero. And then the forms do not move, the reference form do not move with time. G is an LP density. So here, capital F is zero and T is plus infinity. So we can apply the previous theory and uh, the singular Kalanchian current, uh, which I just mentioned was uh, constructed or uh, mentioned last week as a solution of the equation mon pair of phi K E is GDV once properly normalized. Okay, so this is the setting. And then we make a first observation. The first observation is that when I look at the evolution of this uh, parabolic potential phi t, the mean value of, or the, the, yeah, the mean of phi t with respect to the measure GDV is decreasing in time. And why is that so? Because the integral of phi t dot GDV, so phi t dot is the log of the ratio of mon Jean pair of phi t by GDV. So you see that this integral is actually an entropy term. So it's the entropy of, if you normalize conveniently the, the measures, it's the entropy of the mon pair measure with respect to the probability measure GDV. So it is a, a negative term. So it's minus the entropy. Sorry, it's minus the entropy. So it's a negative term. And therefore, this uh, mean is uh, decreasing in time. So once you have made this observation, let me recall that the potential phi ke here is not completely well defined. It's well defined up to normalization. I can change phi ke by adding or subtracting a constant and I will get the same, uh, another solution. So here's the way I would like to normalize phi ke. I would like to, um, to uh, fix the normalization of this Kerr-Einstein potential as the decreasing limit of this uh, phi t GDV. Okay, let me let me do that. <laughs> and then the plan is to uh, check to show that uh, phi t uniformly converges towards phi k e, which is so normalized. <laughs> And the proof goes like this. 
one third observe that phi ke ma minus a large constant is a sub-solution. So you see it, it is called a static sub-solution because it is independent of time. And <coughs> let me go maybe uh, back to the slide where the equation is. So you see that in the equation, if uh, phi t is replaced by phi ke, then uh, the time derivative is zero and phi ke is a solution. So you've got a solution of the equation. Now, if I replace phi ke by phi ke minus a constant, then the equation is the same. But what I do gain is that at time zero, I'm lying below phi zero. So the minus c here is just to make sure that at time zero, I'm less than phi zero. So I get this way a sub-solution. And by adding plus c, I get a static super solution. So putting the two in piece of, of it, pieces of information together, I get a uniform bound for phi t, both in space and time. OK? Remember here that time may be infinite, but I have nevertheless a totally uniform bound on the absolute value of phi t x. Then I make the following important observation that the equation is invariant if I renormalize in time by shifting by a constant. So as we have seen earlier, we have an important uh, Lipschitz estimate. The time derivative of phi is bounded from above by C1, maybe not for time close to zero, but at least for time greater or equal than one, OK? But because the uh, equation is invariant under translation in time, then what I do get is a uniform Lipschitz estimate. I consider now the functional which was denoted by F0 one week ago. So the functional, which is the energy of phi t minus the mean value, the, the mean of phi t with respect to the, the measure of GDV. Then I differentiate this functional along the Kalarishi uh, potential. And what I do get is this quantity. So the first term is integral of phi t dot times the Mongean of phi t. And the second term is minus the integral of phi t dot GDV. But the Mongean of phi t is e to the phi t dot GDV. So if you put these two together, you get integral of phi t dot e to the phi t dot minus one GDV. Then you see that. Uh, e to the phi t dot minus one is simply into the phi t dot minus uh, e to the zero, if you like. So at the end of the day, you have this inequality, which is uh, a celebrated inequality in entropy theory, which says that you can bound from below the time derivative of f of phi t up to a multiplicative constant by the square of the L2 norm of phi t dot with respect to GDV. So you get two important consequences out of that. First, this functional f is increasing along the flow. Remember from last week that one way to solve the, the variational approach to solve the Mongean equation was to try and maximize the functional f. So here, good news, along the flow, f is increasing. But moreover, because f is bounded from above, it cannot increase uh, infinitely. So along at least a subsequence, uh, we can extract a subsequence so that phi t dot goes to zero almost everywhere. And um, thanks to this, you see that along that subsequence, we have the density e to the phi t dot tj, which goes to one. Hence, the Mongean pair of phi tj, which goes to GDV. And then the same stability property that I mentioned earlier, which I did not have time to explain in previous lecture, says that along that subsequence, phi tj uniformly converges towards the limiting guy. And if you now use the invariance of the equation and the semi-group property of the flow, then you see that 
as you as t as times move forward on one hand if you pick t if t turns out to be equal to tj then by what just we just explained phi tj is almost equal to phi ke and on the other hand phi t is the because of uniqueness of the solution of the flow is the same as the solution starting from time tj with the, the, the function phi tj. So in the end, you get that along the whole flow, phi t uniformly converges to one phi k. Phi k. OK, so that's probably a bit too quick, but that gives you the main uh, lines of the proof of um, of this uh, convergence result. And you see it's a relatively uh, straightforward application of this uh, general uh, pre-potential parabolic theory. So here, to finish our a few references, so the main uh, matter of, that I've been discussing in this last lecture is taken from this paper with uh, Chin Lu and Ahmed Zayayi published a few months ago. There is, as I already mentioned, a different uh, point of view uh, that we develop in the local setting uh, in another paper. And this point of view has been pushed one step further by uh, my PhD student with Chin uh, Chuan. And this is a paper that you can find on the archive. And in this paper, Chuan is developing the same theory, uh, but re with regard to big homology classes. And this is here for, for dealing with big homology classes, you cannot approximate by smooth flows. So the, the method that I've just been describing does not apply. So you need to, to use a different approach. And uh, this approach is by using envelopes of subsolutions. So I think it is. It deserves. Uh, it is uh, of interest in itself. So if you if you want more uh, detail uh, about this, please go to this uh, these uh, papers. Okay. So this is it uh, for today. I don't know if you have uh, perhaps some questions. Mm -hmm.